In this lecture, we are going to discuss early modern architecture. Modern architecture has its roots in the United States with the commercial buildings of Henry Hobson Richardson. This image is a photo of the Marshall Field Wholesale Store from 1885 to 87. This building is now destroyed, but its simple design was free from picturesque ornamentation. This paring down of fanciful ornamentation will influence the work of the Chicago School, which was a favored school for young, bright architects. Two notable architects from the Chicago School are Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. This building was demolished in 1929. It was by William LeBaron Jenny. It was considered a proto skyscraper and had true skyscraper construction. It was built by an internal metal skeleton construction. It also had an elevator, which enabled buildings to be built higher. It was unrealistic to expect people to climb 10 flights of steps to get home or to get to work every day. So the elevator made that possible. This building led to the modern urban landscape of skyscrapers. Before the 19th century, the weight of a multi-story building was supported by the strength of the walls. So the taller the building, the more stress was forced onto the walls. These were called load bearing walls. This meant that the walls of the ground floors were very thick and there were limits as to how high they could build. By the mid 1800s, there was a rapid social and economic growth along with the development of inexpensive versatile steel, which made great advances for architects of that day. Steel became mass produced, which enabled the ability to build skyscrapers. By the 1880s, architects could now build thin, tall walls, slender buildings with more lightweight steel skeletons. The floors, walls, windows, and ceilings were suspended from the skeleton, which held all the weight. This way of building was called column frame construction. This column frame construction allowed for buildings to have larger windows, which allowed more daylight into the interior spaces of the buildings. And with thinner walls, there was more usable floor space. This is a guaranteed trust building, now called Prudential Building, built in 1894 to 95 by Adler and Sullivan, although Lewis Sullivan is given more credit. This is an early skyscraper. The building represents a new approach to both structure and decoration. Most modern architects were opposed to the use of ornaments, but Sullivan chose to use it and he designed the ornaments himself and placed them between the shafts and on the top floor. They are intricate on every surface of this detail. The ornaments were made from terracotta and the use of molds, which was very common in that day. Sullivan is credited for saying form follows function which means that the shape of a building or object should be primarily based upon its intended function or purpose. Functionalism is an approach to design that emphasizes a structure's purpose. The function for Sullivan came first. This belief was soon adopted by many modern architects. The structure of a building with its three parts, shops, offices, and utilities, reflects the different functions inside. The offices in the main part of the building had windows and the top floor of the building was for the utilities so there was no need for regular windows. The shops on the bottom had larger windows, a more open floor plan, and the outside of the building on the first and second floors were not decorated with ornaments, which was rare at the time, but it allowed people to see which stores were there and easily enter the building without being distracted. Instead, Sullivan adds ornamental designs and small round, barely visible windows. Now, if we look here on this plan, the floor plan, we could see where the store is located in the front and how it's easily accessible from the street and the court. And it's much open with the floor plan where the offices and rooms in the back are much smaller. Now, 
Sullivan is considered to be the creator of the modern skyscraper. Louis Sullivan was an American architect who is known as the father of skyscraper. He was also Frank Lloyd Wright's mentor. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright was also an American architect briefly employed by the architectural firm of Adler and Sullivan before going on his own. Wright was also an interior designer, writer, and decorator. He designed more than 1,000 structures and completed 532. Wright believed in designing structures that were in harmony with humanity and its environment. He called this philosophy organic architecture. Here is a Willard Willits house from 1902 to 1903. Frank Lloyd Wright was a serious Japanese collector and was influenced by Japanese structures. We see this influence here in the low gabled roof and the facade's vertical stripping. This is a prairie style house with its horizontal accents of the roof line and have the deep overhanging eaves, which mimics the Midwest flat prairie landscapes. The earth's tone blends in and complements the natural surroundings. And here's a diagram of a low gabled roof. And if we look, we can see where it's located right on the house right there. We see this also in Wright's Robbie house from 1909. The fireplace is in the center of the house. There are two horizontal sections. We see the cantilever, which is a term used often when describing Wright's architecture. It's a horizontal projecting element. Here, it's the roof with no external bracing and looks to be self-supporting. However, it is anchored to the structure of the house. And we could see that right here. It appears as if it's floating. However, we, if you look back, it's anchored to the house. There are long symmetrical rows of windows that are set into the brick masses of the house. And I say rows, meaning plural, because there is a row on the other side of the house which we cannot see in the picture. And those rows of windows are right there. The main horizontal design lines of this structure are copied inside the space and outside the space. There is an outward flowing space of the interior and a linear design on the exterior. Here is the inside photo of the dining room of the same house, the Robbie house. Wright's work looks like it would be part of the arts and crafts movement. However, Frank Lloyd Wright, unlike the members of the arts and crafts movement, had no problem using and incorporating objects and parts for structures that were mass produced. Here you can see some of the linear lines that help to define Wright's style. We see them in the chairs right here. We also see them in the ceilings and alongside of the table and the railing. So we see the tables here, this table and the railings. Okay, all throughout the house. Again, I want to stress that Frank Lloyd Wright designed structures that were in harmony with humanity and its environment. Here we have the Kaufman House, also known as Falling Water. Falling Water was built in 1934 to 1937. It is located in the Laurel Highlands in Western Pennsylvania. It was designed and built for his clients, the Kaufman family. This is one of Wright's greatest designs. Here he truly fuses nature with architecture. These next few images that you're about to see are going to be a falling water, and they're just going to accentuate the fusion of nature and architecture together and the use of his linear lines, as you can see here. And if you look through the house from one side through the other, you can see right through the windows into the nature in the background. Here we can see what helps give falling water its name. You can see the water and it goes throughout the house in the bottom and the use of natural materials along again with his signature linear lines. 
Many architects will flatten a piece of land and build on top of it. What makes Falling Water special is that he uses the land around him and he keeps the integrity of the landscape. And we can see this here. You can see this tree going right up. And what he does is he builds around it. And he builds right into the land and the rock along the other side, making this driveway here. So he's working with the landscape, which is embedding it in nature. Here's another excellent example of how he fuses architecture with nature. And you can see that with these boulders here and how he's fusing the house into nature. Here we see falling water embedded in with a lush natural landscape. As mentioned, Wright believed in designing structures that were in harmony with nature and its environment. He called this philosophy organic architecture. Otto Wagner is considered to be the founder of Viennese modernism. To Viennese, early 20th century buildings featured elements of Art Nouveau and modern futurism. His designs for the Vienna subway were simple and functional with some Baroque detail. He was always looking for the new latest materials that could incorporate themselves into modern life. Wagner had a motto that he would say, and that was necessity alone is the ruler of art. This photo shows the hull of the Post Office Savings Bank in Vienna, built in 1905. Wagner used metal and glass to construct this open airy space that fills with light. We see no fancy ornamentation nor anything obstructing the space. Wagner minimizes the structural elements and creates simple, single, unified space that fits in with early modernistic architecture. Here's a portrait of Adolf Loos that we looked at in a previous lecture. Adolf Loos was an architect and followed the same principles as Wagner and Sullivan. What made Adolf Loos noticeable is his use of the barrel vaulted roof, as seen in this image of the Steiner house that he designed in 1910, located in Vienna, Austria. As mentioned, there is no fancy decorative ornamentation seen here. This view is important because it shows the size of the Steiner house, which is deceiving when looked at from the front view. Also, take note of the barrel vaulted roof, which is only in the front. And we can see that right here. The AEG factory by Peter Behrens from 1908 to 1909 in Berlin may not be very exciting to look at, but it is important because it is basically a glass and steel structure. This building appears bulky with much mass because of the masonry piers. Behrens turbine factory is notable for its attention to function. It is extremely functional in the process in which it was manufactured and it's very functional for the employees, which wasn't often considered back in those days. This factory was built to provide the maximum amount of space, air, and light. Just as artists were being more expressionistic with their painting and sculptures from around 1910 to 1925, architects were also becoming more expressive. Architects began emphasizing thematic content of the structure itself. This expression held just as much importance to the architects as the function. Not many important buildings that were expressionistic from this time period were actually constructed. As with many artworks of this time, Nazism had put a stop to their production and many of the existing projects were terminated. Although there is one that I want to show you. This here by Eric Mendelssohn called Einstein Tower dated in 1920 to 1921. Now the purpose of this building was to study spectroanalytic phenomena, particularly Einstein's theory of relativity. The cupola contained instruments that reflected light vertically through the tower onto a mirror 
in a laboratory that is located underground. The cupola is a dome structure on top of the building. And we can see that right here. Here's the cupola. And directly below is a laboratory underground. And you can see the windows right there for that. Mendelssohn wanted to visually show continuity and flow on the exterior, which is on the, one of the strengths of using concrete. However, this building was built using bricks, then covered in concrete but it has the appearance of cast concrete. The window is curved around the corner of the building, accentuating the feel of the continuity and flow. This organically shaped building was a monument as well as a functioning laboratory. One last piece of architecture I wanna show you is by Auguste Pere, which is the Church of Notre Dame, built in 1922 to 1923. This is a Friero concrete building, F-E-R-R-O, concrete building. This carries the characteristics of an early Christian basilica. These characteristics are the long rectangle apse, meaning the vaulted semicircle termination of the building. Also a low arch nave and side aisles that are inside under the low arches of the roof in the back. Now, the nave is a congressional area of the church flanked by aisles, and that is what you're seeing here in this image. Now, we are still looking at Pere's Church of Notre Dame, and the tower here is 145 feet high. Here is a view when looking up from the inside, and if you look close, you can see the stained glass that was created by Marguerite Hure. And this is what we're looking at here, the tower, and this is the interior of that tower. Now, Marguerite Hure used clear glass that was color coded, and this was for economic reasons. However, it is still beautiful and vibrant. There are warmer tones in the sanctuary and blues that dominate the entry. Over on the right of this particular image, you can see the intense greens reflecting on the interior walls right here. And throughout, you can see little bits of different colors of reds and blues and greens, of course. <laughs> the building is known for the refinement and beauty of its design and for its use of ferro concrete, which was a newly developed concrete reinforced by the insertion of steel mesh or rods. It is also referred to as reinforced concrete. It's important to remember from this chapter that modern architecture was facilitated by developments in steel and concrete. 